have the honor of moderating and hosting this and doing pretty much actually what I get to do every day, which is Aaron and I go back and forth on vision and strategy and laying things out and making decisions and having a lot of fun. So that's going to be the baseline of what we're doing. So the goal of this spaces everyone who hasn't read the paper we are going to break it down you can read the paper after you might have read the paper and you're looking for some clarity so we are going to talk through it and if anyone has questions you can comment in the space and the team will answer them afterwards we're not going to do an ama here because we're just going to talk through but we will do one to follow so the goal is is listen, hear it broken down, hear it a bit more digestibly, and then we'll come back and and go through a deep dive of all of our questions. Before we do that, Aaron, do you want to introduce Lenny, and then the three of us will make up the squad for today? Yeah, for sure. Um, So many of you who've been following along will already know Lenny from the ASM community. Um, Lenny is actually our head of intelligence at Um, Futureverse and the product team. Um, So she's been with ASM since the beginning and extremely clever um, game designer and um, scientist that um, has been working with us to try and figure out how we take this protocol forward in a meaningful way um, and has been kind of behind the driving force behind a lot of the um, stuff that has come out in the paper. So excited to have her here and as your kind of new day-to-day face of ASM, um, introducing the one and only Nova. So oh, thanks so much, Aaron. Great to have you up here. Um, it's a pleasure. And, yeah, um, excited to get into a little bit more. As Shara said, to, today is just about kind of summarizing um, what we've put out in the paper and getting people on the same page, letting people have a chance to digest it, and then we'll we'll open up um, another session uh, later, maybe ne- next week, once we get the questions through um, for a proper like deep dive in AMA. Okay, great. So let's start at the beginning. So for for those of you who don't know on here, but a lot of you probably do. So Aaron and I actually know each other through ASM. In 2021, I invested in ASM seed round as an investor. So I was on the other side of the table. And interestingly enough, my investment was anchored in my belief in intelligence powering agents throughout the metaverse. So it was something that I had always believed was going to be a critical component of how the metaverse, aka the internet, would become filled with life, (laughs) to keep it really simple. And so Aaron and I birthed Futureverse really from that initial relationship, which stemmed out of ASM, which is why this has always been a critical part of the vision and a critical part of the Futureverse roll-up. So I think, Aaron, before we go into the paper, why don't you step back and very broadly kind of recap what the vision was then and kind of a little bit of the evolution to where we are now. And then we'll go in obviously a lot deeper. Yeah, I think, um, you know, the genesis of this, like you said, um, started with the, the idea that, um, intelligence would become pervasive on the internet. I was listening to something, um, just a few days ago from Mark Zuckerberg where he was, catching up to the, these these thoughts that we'd had like kind of five or six years ago now, um, you know, saying that there would be more um, autonomous agents on the internet than there will be humans in the world. Um, and that's something that, you know, we thought about back when David and I were playing around with this um, some years ago now. And the notion then was, well, if that's true, um, how does a system like that work? You know, what are the things that are, going to make it successful and what are things that are going to um, enhance um, community participation and individual ownership in that. And that's really where um, ASM came from. It's like, how can we um, design a system for that future world that enables people to participate it, uh, participate in it, and particularly around the notion of ownership. So, you know, mucked around for a bit, um, experimenting, coming up with like the idea and the, the straw man around it, the framework around it. 
that led into some um, some further deeper research that produced the first ASM paper and the patents around the own, the idea of ownership of AI agents using Web3 technology. Um, and then um, ASM, the company, kind of came out of that, which um, started to bring it to life in creative ways. And I think probably, um, you know, the thing that's um, happened since then, or definitely the thing that's happened since then, is we have been able to observe those ideas in the wild a little bit, um, you know, play with them ourselves as developers and figure out what worked and what didn't work um, and understand where those friction points were for making it more scalable. We also got the opportunity to um, see what other people were doing. Um, ASM's uh, in, you know, in a novel position that it was one of the earliest in this space. And so when we created the, um, the patents, we left them as um, what you'd call continuation patents, which meant we could collect ideas over time and add them to that to make the claims stronger. Um, so we're able to learn, you know, what was happening out there and research, do, do further research to kind of strengthen our position in, on that side of things. And then we, um, you know, we were able to um, also see the evolution of AI itself and what that has produced in terms of um, large language models and generative AI and a whole host of other things that have now like become a reality and, and have some meat on the bone to build ideas around. Um, and the combination of all of those things really is what's led to the reset of the ASM protocol, you know, to solve those challenges about usability, developer adoption, scaling and um, innovation with this new range of capabilities. I think what's amazing, and I think, I mean, everyone knows that this is how we focus and we've said this a lot, is that we're always learning. And I think in this space, especially because we talk about the metaverse being something that will never be finished, you have to constantly iterate and iterate and iterate. And that's what gets you to be able to build, like you just mentioned, the continuation of what this can become and allow us, obviously, to continue patenting it. I You just touched on a couple of words that are some of the findings and learnings before we go into the sort of three new components, which we'll break down as simply as we possibly can. We'll do it for how I talk to my mom as, as much as we can, because I've tried to explain this to her and that's hilarious. But do you want to touch any more deeply on any of the specific learnings that led us here? Or do you want to yeah. stay as high level as that? No, I think, um, I think some of the key ones that came out of that were um, one was the Murmur Matrix, which Lenny's had a lot to do with, and um, and also David and and Jesse were a big part of um, the thinking around, um, you know, the the idea that I think when we first started, the idea that um, pervaded um, the thinking of the design was that. Um, agents would be primarily avatar type things. Um, and when we came up with the Murmur Matrix, it became apparent that anything could be intelligent, not just um, a character. And so um, the ability for objects and music and environments and weapons and wearables and all those things to have intelligence um, meant that this was going to have to like scale quite differently. Um, also, um, I think a key part of that is because the Murmur matrix um, works on the context of an object, like what it is, um, what it looks like, um, where it is, what it interacts with, um, it becomes a much more personal thing. Um, and in the in the original design, we had this notion that brains could be more fluid because they were just characters, um, and characters are all the same kinds of things. You know, I'm whether I'm a, a fat human or a skinny human doesn't really matter too much to my context. Um, but if I'm a rock and a human, those are quite different things, and so um, there needed to be like a much tighter coupling between the thing and the intelligence, um, and then. I think the other thing that became really apparent when we started building these 
experiences using the um, the ASM protocol in the brains was that both the user experience and the developer experience was a bit clunky. Um, your developers would have to try and like somehow magically forecast demand um, for um, for new agents um, without knowing up front. Um, users would then have to kind of um, maybe wait in a queue to get a brain while things were being produced in the protocol. Um, there was, you know, the need to like onboard multiple assets in the onboarding journey for a user if they were new. Um, and that kind of structure was not ideal for, for scaling both on the developer side and the user side. Those are probably like the biggest learnings. And then, and then through all that, there's kind of this thread that, um, it didn't tie together nicely from an economic economic point of view, like the protocol economy was a little bit disjointed and broken. Um, and so that was the goal really was to solve those three challenges. How do we make the new ASM um, fit for a world where anything can be intelligent? Um, how do we solve the usability issues for end users and for developers? Um, and then how do we tie those things together economically so that they that so there's a clearer kind of value lineup amazing makes sense that clearly lays out why we got to where we got so now let's break apart each thing let's go one by one so let's start with the asm non-fungible intelligence protocol which is the core and that's obviously where we opened the paper so i explained this to my mom because everyone knows I love to try to figure out how to explain these things to my mom. So here's how I explained this to my mom. I think we should play a little game where I tell you how I explained it to my mom and you then go way <laughs> deeper. So this is how I explained it to my mom. I said, okay, there are digital things in the digital landscape of the internet, like a character or like an accessory. And she was like, right, like you, she has a boxer. So she was like, okay, so I can be the boxer. And I was like, now imagine that the boxer needs the ability to think for itself and learn and evolve. So it becomes more interactive. Now think about the fact that there are going to be developers who want to build applications and experiences like TNL, and they are going to want to add brains to their assets. So now they can come in and pay a fee in the protocol effectively. This is a simple way I explained it to her to make them more interactive and interesting. And therefore the whole experience of the internet is a lot richer. So that was the very, very broken down explanation I gave her of the intelligence protocol. Now, yeah. how, how would you make it a lot nerdier? <laughs> um. I can probably do both, like right. make it nerdier and maybe even simplify it. I think um, like the, the protocol itself is really straightforward and it is, it goes like this. If you're minting an asset on the root network, you can flick a switch and add a brain and a murmur matrix card to it. So that's like the simplest way to um, think about this. And um, that switch costs a masto. So if you um, want to make your thing intelligent, then you can. And the way to do that is to pay a small fee when you when you mint it, or at some time in the future if you want to upgrade it. Um, so that's kind of the essence of the non fungible intelligence protocol. Okay, um, real quick. Palette quickly teach my mom what a murmur card is yeah yeah so i think one of the big things that has changed is when when we conceived asm um the types of things that an agent could be were um were based around the notion that um you would train a specific agent to do a specific thing um, and that agent then would, um, would you would store the data of that agent alongside the brain. Um, and that necessitated a whole bunch of things like training infrastructure and machine learning skills and all that kind of stuff. And we, we built 
that capability in Paddy. Um, but we actually, and we use that capability in things like TNL. Um, but when we when we looked at both the way that came together and the skills you needed to build it, plus the way that um, AI had evolved, we quickly realized that the more important thing was not like linking your brain to machine learning infrastructure um, and having that set up. It was more important to have a data structure that could interact with things like um, LLMs and pre-trained models, uh, generative models. And so um, if you think about the most important thing in the today's landscape of AI is not to try and decentralize training infrastructure, for example, because that's silly. Um, you know, the best training infrastructure will be, um, you know, in well-constructed data centers. Um, and it's, and because these are pre-trained models, it doesn't matter that they live there because once you train them, you can take them out and put them anywhere. Um, and then there's the bit that follows on for that is inference, um, and inference will end up being on your device. So like decentralizing that process doesn't make a lot of sense either. Um, and so if you put those two things, you know, as assumptions, then the most important thing is to have data that interacts with models, these pre-trained models. Um, and that's what the MIMA matrix is. It's a system for collecting data interactions between agents and making them available to any model. So you can bounce off all the great open source work that's already been done, include that one of those models in your applications and the MIMA matrix will evolve based on interactions with all of those models, as opposed to having to, to train a specific one for your agent. It's not the model that follows your agent, it's the data that follows your agent and it can interact with any model. And that does some really cool things. It makes it easier for developers to build stuff because they can leverage off all the open source stuff that's going on out there. You don't have to get into the infrastructure side so much, although we will get into that, um, but at a different way than other people are thinking about it. And we'll share some more on that after we get Substrate 1 out and look at the the way the ASM network evolves. Um, and then we, yeah, and then we, then we, and then you can do things like have an experience where your agent interacts with model A and app A um, and model B and app B and it feels like the same thing because all of the data is the same and that data is the thing you carry with you between these agents. So it's about maintaining the data state for intelligence that can interact with any model and especially as these models evolve very quickly can adapt over time as the new ones come out. Um, so that gives us a lot more like flexibility and interoperability than existed in the first um, in the first iteration of the protocol. Okay, that interoperability, main, maintaining the data and allowing it to move through to, first off, my mom's never going to understand that, but that was <laughs> that was great. Like, I, I'm with you 100%. So my mom, not so much. So she's trying to get a trip to New Zealand. For, and she said for, she your, mo for your mom, <laughs> the simplest way to think about it is that it, your intelligence follows you no matter how the application on the other side, you know, the experience, the game, whatever that you're going into has developed the uh, um, experience. So, and the, the, what, the reason the intelligence follows you is the same as why it follows you as a human, which is your intelligence is the sum of all your memories and experiences in your brain. And so the, that is data. Exactly. Um, it's not, and that's the thing that follows you is the data. Exactly. And this ability for interoperability allows for the scalable use of this framework because now when developers employ the way that we have just outlined this all of these assets will be able to move through multiple worlds not just theirs which adds value back to the user and ultimately expands the internet let's talk yeah. about the launch pad off of I that yeah, I think, well, just to like finish that, and you might have something yep. to add, Lenny, to this. Um, like, I think the Murma Matrix card can be thought of as an AI cookie. Like, it's a thing you can take with you between experiences that tells the experience the stuff about you and puts context into that that makes it more personal. 
that's that's kind of a really simple way to think about what the Mirror Matrix card is, um, and and that cookie can evolve based on um, on the interactions it has with an, other intelligent agents. Would that be a good way to think about it? Yep, Lenny, do you want to add anything to that? Um, yeah. So. Really, I think one of the best ways to really describe the importance of the Murmur Matrix and having that card format that, you know, has that data layer um, and enabling anything to become intelligent is from the perspective of maybe a gamer. Um, so the more interactive and dynamic a world that you're immersed in, the more elevated your gameplay or experience within that world feels, right? So, like, for example, if my agent is able to interpret and interact with the environment around me and adapt its behavior to fit that situation, purely by the sharing and understanding of that data or the information or states happening within that world um, and with the interpretation and expression of those events or like interactions showing continuity with the profile or like characteristics of my agent. I feel like that's where, you know, things really come to life. Um, so that's the way yeah. that I like to look at it. Yeah, and, it, and games are a good, good way to explain it. Um, you know, like I've used that example of um, in the paper of a rock that has a card and a space that has a card and if that space has properties let's say it's a toxic toxic lake and that rock spends time there it will absorb some of the properties of the things near it so not only bringing like memories and experience with you between different things but also allowing that interaction between agents to evolve the meta of that data layer and that data layer essentially becomes the persistent world that is the metaverse so the murmur matrix is the metaverse um, because that is where the data lives about the, the things that the experience build off and you can like go really deep on this and um you know connect it to the bits the layers above it but like a simple thing is that rock um, might have started out as not being toxic but now that it's spent time in that toxic environment, um, it can interact with our generative 3D so that it produces a toxic looking rock. And so the form of the rock can evolve based on the card when it interacts with these things. And when that rock goes into another environment, the, the UBF blueprint, which is also a Murmur Matrix card, um, can um, display the toxic rock properties to that environment and it will be toxic in the other environment too. Lenny, you got a hand up. Go hard. <laughs> I actually, I accidentally put my hand and up. Also and just, it oh, okay. <laughs> 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 but you can just butt in. <laughs> yeah, cool. <laughs> awesome. Lenny was just high-fiving everyone. That that's also a use for the hand. Love it. So, okay, if Lenny doesn't have anything to add, Aaron, let's jump into, so the Launchpad protocol is around the focus of licensing, obviously, the technology and the patents and the components of ASM. Do you want to give an overview explanation of the Launchpad? Yeah. Um, and just to say, like, I think we've, I've seen some questions floating around around, will, will everyone have a brain? Um, I think that's like totally the wrong way to think about it because there are only like 7 billion humans on the planet um, and certainly not all of them are going to engage with this protocol, but there are trillions of things that can exist in the digital space and the things have brains. And so that's like quite a big switch in terms of how to think about this. Even little rocks can have their own brains. Um, in terms of the launch pad, what we wanted to do was like, you know, we've got these patents and there's a very strong portfolio there we we had um another one granted this month um and there's 30 or so in the we actually had two granted this month sorry um and there's 30 or so in the um, pipeline that are linked to the intelligence stuff that we're doing and we wanted to design a way where people who are building in this space can benefit from those innovations and the the way that they um, provide freedom to operate if you're building stuff in the space, but also recognize that the genesis of this thing started with the ASM protocol and the community around it. Um, so the launch pad um, provides the opportunity for people who are building um, 
things that leverage ASM's innovations to gain um, the ability to use that license and leverage that license, um, but also do it in a way that doesn't necessarily tie them to um, building everything with us because people are going to build things all over the place in the open metaverse. We want this to be as open as possible. Um, they're going to build things differently to the way that we build them in terms of the technology side of things, but they might use the same ideas. Um, and so um, the launch pad provides the opportunity for them to connect to the ASM community to do a few things. One, you can get a, a license to use our innovations, which means if someone tries to sue you, um, you can say, hey, I've got this patent here um, and you can't sue me because these innovations are protected by it. Um, two, it means that um, they can reach the ASM community. They might have something cool that the community wants to be a part of. And as this thing grows um, and more people who are in or the AI, the AI Web3 community join and figure out that they can participate in this, that'll be a great place for them to find new um, users or developers or um, ideas about how to, um, you know, grow their grow their application ecosystem or experience. Um, and so, so instead of kind of um, taking a traditional approach to how you might license stuff, we've tried to take a community approach, which helps those developers grow their communities, um, leverage the innovations, you know, build on top of the ideas of ASM, even if the technology we built doesn't work for them and create value for the whole ASM ecosystem in doing so. So when they join the protocol, um, first thing they do is they, they grab a brain that's like their key, their ID in the system, um, Gen 1 brain, and then they can um, contribute to the launch pad, something from their ecosystem. So it could be a token that powers their experience, it could be NFTs that are inside of their game. Um, and then those things go into a big pool of rewards. That's really what the Launchpad is about, bringing developers who are working on these ideas together with communities, the, the ASM community, um, so that they can enhance their, their own products and grow their community too. Amazing. The Gen 1 obviously has always been my favorite asset. I think of it in a lot of ways, like how we talk about, well, how I always ask Marco if he can figure out how to clone us, but yeah. separate from that, the, the, all of the ideas and the patents inside of our brain, I think the Gen 1s represent an amazing example of how they effectively hold the patents yeah. and intelligence of everything that we have come up with and all of our ideas given the evolution and continuation of what will come into that patent. It's yeah. the ability as a community member or holder of that brain to, to hold a piece of the accessibility into yeah. that innovation and all of the brilliance that we're really proud of that we've put into this. So huge. Yeah. And that's, um, yeah. That's, um, that's, that's only going to like, there are some other really cool things coming for, for Gen ones, which will um, which will announce part, you know, as part of that um, next phase of rollout that I talked about around ASM networks. So, um, so, it, and and probably the last thing to cover there is why Gen ones are the kind of default um, for brains going forward, um, and that um, that comes down to actually something that's quite simple. Um, when Gen 1 Brain's matrix was designed, it has a specific um, color palette associated with it. And that color palette is part of how we derive the emotional state of an agent. So if you think about like the idea of ASM, one of the big things we wanted to solve for was how do you make lots of agents, billions of agents in the metaverse different? Because we don't want them to be the same. Otherwise, things will get boring. And so the genome matrix is like the key to that. It provides attributes, whether those are skills um, or um, other things that can be leveraged by experiences in order to create that point of difference between different agents in a randomized way. 
one of the things we derived from the genome matrix was emotions. And so adding two skills, which everyone, you know, a lot of people participated in crafting the skills matrix and mapping that out, which is now used in races and TNL and um, Grumble. Um, the emotional bit actually comes from the colors of your brain. Um, so Jesse did a whole bunch of work. Jesse's a, you know, very accomplished um, designer with mas masters in design um, and came up with this um, idea of mapping um, colors to emotions from the brain. And so your default emotional state for your agent comes from the colors of the matrix. And that just didn't work with the way that Gen 2 brains were designed. Do you want to explain a little bit about Gen 2s and yeah. what will happen with Gen 2s? Yeah, so, I mean, the, I think the first thing is um, they'll, they'll all continue to work as they do now in the applications and experiences, and you can still build off of those yeah. matrices if you want to um, as a developer. So, so that doesn't change, both Gen 1 and Gen 2. Um, the because we've made this change on our side, we thought it was important to like provide value back to the community. Um, you know, even though this change is made for the greater good, there's direct like implications on, on those brains, the Gen 2 ones. Um, and so there's a few things that happen now. Um, we've, we've got um, an upcoming release of the Third Kingdom where you can take your Gen 2 brain and turn it into um, intelligent land in TTK. Um, and that will combine with the All-Stars to create a new game layer inside of TTK that will be linked directly to Asto rewards. So transforming them back into Illyria, kind of, um, in a way, um, and giving you know that utility for those brains inside of TTK linked specifically to Asto rewards is the way to solve for that utility problem for Gen 2 brains. Amazing. So before, we have one more thing to get to, which is the void. It, what's funny is someone had just texted me saying wrap up and get Aaron to say some alpha. And I <laughs> you said actually two things of alpha in between yeah. the last <laughs> thing you said and two things ago. So probably things that, yes. So you've already said it. So I'm now going to wrap up instead with the void, which is the perfect end to recap all three. So let's go into the void 2.0 and give an overview of that. Yeah, so the void kind of brings those two things together um, in an economic way. So um, those people who have been staking ASTO for ASTO energy can now take that energy um, and use it in the void. And what the void does is collects all of the rewards um, from fees that are paid in the non-fungible pallet, from things that go into the launch pad, um, and makes them available to the people who are participating in the Asto energy economy. So generating energy gives you access to a share of those rewards. Um, and so we're kind of creating um, that value circle now people can generate brains and pay fees to do that they can leverage the innovations and contribute value to the asm ecosystem and the people who are holding and staking asto can receive the benefit of those two things so it's very meta because effectively if you generate good energy you get rewards in the world and <laughs> <laughs> thematically having the perspective of a rock in a world where you're not a rock gives you an unbelievable perspective on other perspectives in the world. So I think that, which is how we've designed all of this always, it's so synonymous and metaphorical with everything that exists in the world. And so while it feels really complex at times, it's actually really, really simple. And I think Lenny, your point on when you have that contextual understanding of something, it simply elevates your experience, is how simple this really is at the end of the day of what we're ultimately trying to do to expand the way developers and individuals get to experience this other layer of the internet that we call the metaverse. So 
Eleni, Aaron, is there anything else to add? Aaron, I think you just summed up all of the things that we had talked about really well with that last point, obviously ending in rewards because everyone wants to know how they'll participate and that's critically important to everything yeah. that we think about. I think it's, it was kind of a, a missing element of how Esto worked. It was there wasn't a really clear loop and there was only really one vector for generating protocol momentum and protocol value and now we have three um and so three announced ver um, versions of of vectors of of protocol value with a fourth um to come so i think um combination of those things puts us in a really good spot to evolve this um no one would ever say we've solved every problem but i think it's a very meaningful step forward in um in taking this thing and scaling it to the level that we think it can can get to and it should and it deserves to get to i would agree and just to chime in on just the level of thought and strategy and planning and execution that has gone into this from our teams and and everyone at futureverse has been a tremendous amount of work and so to everyone that has been working on this on our side and everyone out there should know how um, strategic we have been and how we've thought through everything that we're doing. And we plan for a lot of amazing things to come. And I was, I've was i been looking through the questions that have been popping up on on Twitter. So I think you answered, or I think you answered a lot of them, Aaron, and we've touched on a lot of those points. But like we said at the beginning, anyone who has questions, feel free to drop them. Um, in the comments, and then also we'll come back with an AMA so we can engage even deeper on anything that anyone wants to break down further. And and if you haven't read the paper, reading it now might also be helpful to, to go further in any areas now that Aaron gave a good primer to the why and the how. So feel free to do that on the website. And thank you guys for jumping thank up you. and talking. And we'll see everyone soon. Bye.